excited uh, to introduce you to our uh, associate pastor Moses Vasquez, who will bringing us be bringing us today's message called "Disconnect to Reconnect." Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, sister. Love you, sister and sister. All right, you guys, turn on the lights because I want to see these beautiful people out here. If you don't mind, what a morning! It is thick in here. Praise God. I'm so happy. My heart is just, I need to like really focus right now because my heart is just all over the place. Uh, but I'm thankful for you. Welcome. If you're a guest, we had a challenge within the church to invite someone. So I praise God that some of you are here and, uh, and make yourselves at home. This is our little church. We speak where the Bible speaks and we be quiet where it be quiet. Amen. So this, this word today is simply disconnect to connect. And we, it's simple. Uh, to connect with someone, anyone, you need to disconnect. There's nothing more annoying if you're at a table with your spouse, with your family, and you're trying to talk to them, and they're kind of over here. I'm, I'm, I'm not pointing anybody out. Don't be nudging nobody right now, okay? Uh, but it's that real, right? I mean... To connect with somebody, both of you need to disconnect. Amen? Has anybody ever told you, call your mom? You better call your mom, Tristan. Has anybody ever told you that when you were little? Uh, you, you need to call your dad. Mia, you need to call your dad. And it's like, oh, man, you know, what did I do? What happened? Right? Call your dad. Well, I'm here to tell you today, church, this is my assignment. Call your father. We need to call our Father. Amen? Let's pray. God, you're everything. I can't begin to describe who you are because you are everything. And Lord, before I ask anything, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for everything. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for pulling us out of where we were. Father, thank you for the every single little detail in our lives that we take for granted. And now, God, I ask, I ask, I need your help. I'm just a sinner. And I need your help. We need your help. I need help to deliver this message, Lord, and we need help to receive it, Father. Help us disconnect. We need to disconnect Father, I know you are waiting for our call. Help us call you, Father. Help us disconnect. This I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, man. So, Pastor Bart, uh, you know, read this so well. And, man, honestly, the word speaks for itself, right? You really really don't need a message or a sermon when you you understand the word like this. So this is a, a portion of the famous Sermon on the Mount, right? And there's so much great stuff in the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, this is from Jesus' lips directly, okay? But today we're going to focus on verse 6 through 15 of chapter 6, and we're going to talk a little bit about prayer. We're going to camp out a little bit in verse 6, and then we'll head down to verse 14, uh, 15. So prayer, this sounds like an everyday thing, kind of like a household item, kind of like a phone charger, kind of like your keys, kind of like your, you know, it's just an everyday thing, Moses. We're, why are we talking about something that we all do? I think God wants us to know some things this morning, and he really impressed it on us this morning, that he wants to know a little bit about the what is prayer, when should we pray, how should we pray, and why. And my goal today is that we listen and that we learn and maybe apply some new things or maybe bring back some older things, some older principles and practices to make our prayer life better. We're going to cut this a little uh, a bite at a time, okay? The Bible says, and if, I don't know if you want to pull up the verse, it says, but when you pray, go by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. Then your father who sees everything will reward you. So before we even go too far, the, the, the second word says, when we pray. Church, I need to tell you that it's not a matter of if, but when we pray. 
if we are going to get anywhere in our walk with Christ, if we're going to get anywhere in understanding who he is, if we're going to get anywhere, even in the slightest, to figure out what he has planned for our lives, to acknowledge that he exists, it's not a question of if we pray, but when we pray. Let me tell you, there's really no reason for me to continue teaching about this if we're not praying. So if we're not there, I'm not here to whatever, I'm here to say, okay, that's step one. I need to start praying, okay? Then we're going to learn a little bit about what it is. And what prayer is, is communication. People will say it conveying. They will say it's talking to God. Ask God. He can answer you. He will tell you what this is. But I can tell you this. It is intimate. It is personal. Okay? How can you have any relationship, more or less an intimate relationship, without talking? Can you imagine? Without communication. Think about it. How would you enjoy your relationship if the person doesn't want to talk to you? They don't look forward to talking to you. They try at all costs to avoid talking to you. They see it like, oh, man, I have to. This is something I have to do. What kind of relationship is that? And this is what God sees when we don't want to talk to him. And I'm not asking you if this is a situation. I'm telling you that this happens to me. So I don't know if, we're, you know, I pray that we're in a holy, safe place and we're honest with ourselves. If you struggle with it like I struggle with it, sometimes I don't want to. I'm tired. I'm mad at my spouse. I don't feel like praying. You're all mad, right, Brother Hug? You pray. No, you pray. Well, you pray. (laughs) Who's going to pray? I'm being honest, right? We all do it. We're too busy, too tired. Or maybe there's new people around me. I don't want them to freak out. I'm in the workplace. There's a lot of different reasons. So we'll send up a little shotgun prayer. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. (laughs) What we're saying in this relationship with God is saying, Yes, God, you're my God. I I get it. I know you love me. And I understand that you love me so much you gave your son for me. I understand that you give me everything that I need. I understand that you take care of me and that you protect me from all evil things that I see, things that I don't see. But I still really don't want to talk to you. And I really don't want to listen either. What kind of relationship is that? What kind of marriage is that? That's right. The Bible says that you and I are the bride of Christ. Do you hear me? The Bible says that you and I, the church, is the bride of Christ. How healthy is our marriage with our Father? How healthy is the communication with our Father? And I, it, it's really easy to understand. I mean, I believe sometimes I'm like, Lord, is this why I struggle with communication in my marriage? Are you really trying to show me what it's like when I don't talk to you? Is this an example? Are you really trying to? Because, man, I wish that he would tell me or I wish she would talk to me. And he's like, I wish you would talk to me. What kind of relationship is that? Catch this. Husbands, listen to me. A good reason why some of us are suffering from lack of communication with our spouse is because the real lack of communication is with our father. Call your father. Wives. Watch it, you're not out of it. Wives, a good reason why you're probably suffering with a lack of communication with your spouse could be your lack of communication with your father. I'm here to tell you today, call your father. We need to grow up, church. We really do. We really do. We're, we're, a lot of times we're focused on growing, and obviously, praise the Lord, there's, there's hardly any church. Praise the Lord for that, right? But let me tell you something. I don't believe he is going to allow us to grow because these are his people. They're not ours. He's not going to allow us to grow until we grow up. Our prayer life can't be one of a six-year-old when we're 18 years old. You hear me, Teenagers? They know, student life, sorry, I beat up your kids on Wednesdays. If you're praying like a six-year-old, 
and you have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, it's one thing if you don't know him, you're a guest, that's one thing. But guys, we need to grow up. You guys are driving cars now and have bank accounts, and we're praying like six-year-olds. Our prayer life can't be of a 13-year-old when we're 30 or 40 or 50. Talk to your father. And listen, I'll talk about listening here in a minute. We need to start gearing up our prayer life like we understand who is on the other side of the phone. Right? You know, we get so excited, or, or, or it just depends. It depends who's, who's calling. You know, if it's the robocall or the telemarketer, well, you know, I get that, right? And we don't, you know. For me, it was like cons for 10 years. Cons, I, you, can't, you can't give home after me no more. It's, it's done. It was back in my, my pre-Jesus life. You can, you can send me the bill. It don't matter. But we look at those bill collectors, or we, sometimes we treat the call on who it is. Oh, I don't want to talk to this brother. Or, man, I, that's going to take forever, whatever. Right? But sometimes we have calls we do want to get. Some calls, that, oh, that's my mom. You know, or, or, well, it could be both ways. Oh, that's my mom. <laughs> or, you know what I mean? You see what I'm saying? Oh, I want to take this call. Oh, I've been waiting for this call. It's a new job. I've been waiting. Wait, 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 let me. And when we were younger, when we were dating, you guys, back in the day, oh my gosh, my sisters, let me tell you. When it was a call that came in for them, they would grab the phone and have the longest extension cord in the whole world and walk all the way to another room and have that call. And they would stay on that call all night long. Because there's some calls that you want to have. There's some calls that you want to take. But when we're talking to God, do we understand who is on the line? Do we really get who is picking up, who is on the other side of the phone? Do we understand that it is a privilege to talk to God? That it didn't come for free. The blood that Jesus spilled gave us the authority and the privilege to talk to his father. So father had to pay for the ability to talk to him. He paid with the beloved son, Jesus. Before that, there was no access for you and for me. But because he died and he took the penalty of our sins, he removes the barrier. That's a privilege. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.16, Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The Bible says in John, uh, 1 John 5.14, This is the confidence we have in approaching God. I'm talking about prayer here. That if we ask according to His will, He hears us. I just want to bring a reminder today. He's not just anyone on the phone. He's not just anyone in your prayer line. He is the one. He's the only one. Maybe this helps us understand when next time we're on prayer. He's the beginning. He's the end. The everlasting. The greater God. The I am. I'm the present. I'm the potent. Forever and ever. That is who you have on the line. Amen. Maybe we should take some time to take that call. Amen. We need to recognize who we're talking to. The Bible tells us in Psalm 116, 2 through 4, and it's one of my favorite verses, and I don't know, my imagination is kind of crazy, so I, I picture this. It says, because he bends down to listen, I will pray as long as I have breath. Oh, my God. Because he bends down to listen, I'm, I'm picturing just the toe of God and how huge that must be. If he even has a toe. And then I imagine this ear that's beautiful and enormous. And out of all the things in this world, when I call him, this huge ear comes down to listen to me when I pray. To you when you pray. That's what the word says. And because I understand that, I will pray as long as I have breath. Come on, church. As long as I have breath, I will pray. Thank you, God, for listening to me. I'm trash. I'm a sinner. I'm a filthy rag. And yet you still think that I'm important enough 
to bend down and listen to me when I pray. Jeez. We got to get better, church, at praying. We got to get better. And I don't mean louder. I don't mean uh, longer. This ex- the word extravagant has been a bit word today. Or more extravagant. That's not what I mean by better at praying. We're always going to have short prayers because they're called for. Like the one you have right be- between the chips and salsa before the meal, right, Esme? She will call you out. If you go eat with her and, and, and you're about to take a bite of your chip and you haven't prayed yet, be prepared. She will catch you mid-chip. That's my, that's my sister. She's been called. Those are informal prayers. Those are things that we do. I'm not talking about those type of prayers. I'm not talking about uh, the checkoff prayers that you do at night. I'm referring to true, intentional, sacrificial, I'm going to shut it down, leave me alone, close the door. I'm going to cry if I have to. I'm going to speak out if I have to. My brother Hobby showed me this. You know, I praise God for a lot of people in here that have showed me what it's like to truly pray and to cry out to God. If we're, we, the prayer that I'm talking about is going to say, this is the time with my dad. This is the time with my father. It was a song uh, back in, when I was growing up in the Spanish church in Robstown. And uh, I might have a translation here, but it said, uh, uh, Si tú hablas con Dios, Las cosas cambiarán orando. Cualquier necesidad, Dios la resolverá orando. Confía en el Señor, tus penas quitará orando. Bendita oración, yo quiero hablar con Dios. Orando. That is someone who understands the blessing of prayer and wants to talk to God. For whatever reason, God is very heavy on us saying, I need you to talk to him. And I think it is, you know why? I mean, I don't know why, but I just feel like, because there's so much information coming. There's so much information coming from everywhere. And I mean all over the place. You get on your phone, and it's instant. It's coming. The morning you wake up, YouTube, I don't care if you're not on Instagram or, 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 or uh, on social media, it's just coming. It's coming. What he wants you to do is to intentionally focus with a sincere and genuine heart. He gave us a direction. How do we do that? we're going to have to step away, right? What does step away look like? What does it sound like? Do we step away? Do you have what it takes? to actually step away. To spend alone time with God. We sang it. Away, away from the noise to be with you. Alone means alone. By yourself. No distraction. In Mark 1.35, the Bible says, Before daybreak, the next morning, Jesus got up and he went out to an isolated place to pray. Matthew 14.23 says, After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell. And he was there alone. Church alone brings us intimacy with God. Into communion with God. 
Can you imagine the psalmist and what he was thinking and how much in intimacy and communion he was when he wrote Psalm 63, 5 through 6. He said, you satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. And I lie awake thinking of you. Meditating on you through the night. Alone, church, means alone. It means by yourself. And I get it. I understand that. Some of you are professionals. Some of you have businesses. Some of you are responsible for children. I get that. But God is showing us how to have an intimate, personal relationship. You cannot forget this step. Where should I say? Moses, you cannot forget this step. Because it's hard. It's hard. But here's the deal. I was asking Sister Tor earlier, like, what are you doing, man? You look amazing. Like, tell me, right? Or when someone, you know, is doing something that we like, or man, I wish, you know, not in a jealous way, but like, man, that's inspiring. What, what did you do? What's the secret? I'm here to tell you it's no secret. Jesus, the greatest teacher, went alone. Moses did it. Elijah did it. Abraham, the ba- uh, sorry, Abraham and John the Baptist did it. All of Israel would do it. Go alone. Getting alone with God. I want you to write that down if you're taking notes. I get it. It's hard. But this is how we have intentional messages or talking to God. Intentional. Means I mean to. Because we talk to God all day. What do you mean, Pastor? Oh, yeah. We send messages up to heaven all day long, church. But they're unintentional. They are. I'm, I'm I'm being honest. This is me, you know. You send messages to heaven. Everyone else sends messages to heaven. And they're unintentional. And you know what it sounds like? God, you're not important to me. God, you're useless in this situation. You can't do anything about it. God, you don't exist. You tell them, God, I don't trust you. God, you're not enough. These are messages that you and I send to God all day long and we don't mean to but we send them by how we act how we talk by what we do by what we don't do these messages go up unintentionally all day long what messages are you and i sending to god i don't have time you're not important i'm gonna do what i want to do anyway i get it there's people here helping me I, i see them i get that but i'm gonna i'm gonna take this advice or i'm gonna go this route These are messages that we're sending. That's not prayer. That's unintentional messaging. If we're going to grow spiritually in a relationship with him, we need more wisdom. We need more intimacy with God. We need to get alone with God and find out what he really wants. You know why alone is a big deal? Because you can learn a lot about yourself and about God when you're alone. It's crazy that the men's retreat is called alone. God is just really working this out. I don't know. He's, God, I'm almost afraid of what he's going to do. But you really know who you are alone. When your friends are gone, when your families are gone, when you're left alone, you really know who you are when you're alone. What you do, what you plan, what you say, what you see, what you watch, what you buy when you're alone. It's different than when you you buy when you're with someone. What you hear, what you allow yourself to participate in, what you allow yourself to tolerate and accept is different when you're alone. What you allow and what you don't. My challenge for you, church, is the next 21 days. Spend some alone time with God. Be intentional in this effort. And you're probably saying, what? what, what do I pray about? If I'm going to spend all this time, am I just going to sit there and be quiet? I, 
I have a little bit of help here. There's a slide that maybe helps you out. And in the beginning, if you just don't know exactly what you're going to uh, pray about, start with yourself. Let me tell you something, church. There's so many things that I need help with. There's so many things that I, I need to fix with myself. There's so many emotions that I have, so many feelings that I have, so many doubts that I have. I promise you that if you spend time alone with God, that portion's going to take a while. And it's not about having a long, lengthy prayer. It's about being real with God. He's your Father. Start with yourself. Then go a little further out. You got your family. I mean, just think about it for a second. Think about the family, the immediate family, the cousins, people struggling, people hurting. Then go on. The church. What would happen if our, church, if our prayers were intentional, our prayer time with God, and all of you would pray for each other? What would happen? <laughs> what would happen? That's right. Then your social spirit, that's basically your friends, your work. Your co-workers, your company, your business. Pray for your business. Then your community. I know the city of Alice needs prayer. I know the city of Robstown needs prayer. I know Corpus Christi needs prayer. I know Kelala needs prayer. And then, can we all agree that our country needs prayer? I promise you, these are things help you. Take a picture. I don't care. Just understand that there's so much to pray about. And we cheat ourselves and we cheat um, the blessings that God is, is ready to bestow on us if these things align with his will by doing half-week prayers. Our prayers, look they sound more like, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I need, I need, I need in Jesus' name. That's what they sound like. It doesn't matter whether you pray out loud or you pray silently. You saw the warning. Don't pray to impress anybody ridiculous he hates that he says you know what whatever they saw ooh, you know brother moses prays real good that is your reward don't expect anything from god there you go <laughs> shut down the storehouse you got your reward and he knows what's going on inside and bad proverbs 15 26 says god judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart that's hebrews uh 4 12 i'm sorry and in Proverbs, he says, the Bible says, the Lord hates the thoughts of the wicked, but those of the pure are pleasing to him. Amen. There's a scripture that I really love about praying to God. You ever hurt so bad that you can't say a word? You ever been there? Rock bottom? Something happened so much you can't even talk. It's just pain. Something happened to your family, something happened to your spouse, something happened to your relationship. It's just pain. God, I can't even talk. The Bible says in Romans 8, 26, listen to this. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. He's still there for you. That is, he just says, you know what? Come to me if you don't say nothing. I get it. You're on the line. You don't have to say a word. I'm just going to be here for you. And I get it. I see your heart. I can I, just get on the line with me. Real quick, I'm going to go over some slides and then we're, we're done. But basically, just the type of prayers, church. There's different types of prayers. And, and they, you can pray them all together. You can pray them separately. However, these are just types. And there's more, I'm sure. But I just want to help here, okay? Um, supplication and petition. That means things you're asking God for, what he can supply, what, he, what you need. Father, I need help. I need help to pass these tests for these students. I need help to pay these debts. I need to make better choices financially. Lord, help me with my anger, with my lust. Lord, help me be a better son. Help me be a better daughter. Help me be, help my marriage, my children. Petition, supplication is one style of prayer. The next one is thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for providing for me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for my health. Thank you for my life now. Thank you for saving. Thank you for my children. Thank you for my job, my home, my vision, my ability to walk. Thank you for the clothes that I eat. Thank you for the air that I'm breathing, God. Thank you, Lord. I mean, you can stay there forever. If you take time. If you're intimate. Other style, adoration. That's just praising God for 
who he is, and that is called his Essex. God's Essex is everything that he is, and that's a lot. Everything that he is, his greatness, his characteristics, he's holy, he's good, he's fair, he's a healer, he's a provider, he's a creator of everything, almighty, all faithful, never failing. Those are all the characteristics of God. Adoration, acknowledgement. You hear a lot of the older folks pray in this form. Uh, either I've heard it in Spanish, uh, Señor Dios, Creador del Cielo, de la Tierra y todo lugar, you know giving them the adoration and saying, I'm not just talking to somebody, I'm talking to Father God who I recognize created the heavens and the earth and who is able and willing to help me in these situations. Confession is a, is a form of prayer. You can, Like I said, you can mix it all up or you can just say, Lord, I'm going to pray in confession. That's owning up to the things that we do, things that we say, owning up to any kind of sin, things that we may think that we may have done wrong. Asking God for mercy, asking Him forgiveness, Whatever, procrastinating, lying, being disrespectful to our husbands, not loving our wives, things that we've said, things that we've done, confession, confession, confession. There's a power in releasing that. And then the last uh, form, or not last one, but the one I'm going to say, talk about here is intercession. That means, you know what, I'm putting myself on this, I'm forgetting about myself, and I'm going to pray about everybody else. I'm not going to mention anything about myself. I'm just praying for you, Orlando. I'm praying for you, brother. I'm praying for you. I know what's going on in your life. I know what's going on with your grandkids. I'm praying for Trevor at his work. I'm praying for Brielle. I'm praying for everyone else. I'm not putting myself on this line because I'm interceding or standing in the gap for somebody. That's intercession. I'm interceding. God, I, I'm going to be the bridge right now. They're not close to you yet. My, my son, my daughter don't have the relationship that you want with them yet. I'm going to hold on to them. You're going to hold on. I'm going to intercede for these people. I'm going to be like that's a... Like that uh, centurion. Just say the word. These are models. And God gives us a model to pray, okay? I'm going to wrap it up here. He gives us a model. And we've, we saw that. I kind of threw Pastor Bart there for a little loop because it was a New Living Translation, right? We know it. I mean, guys, but here's the deal. We have turned that prayer into something so watered down. We, it is something that just said at a sports game. I mean, kids that don't ever know God and the parents didn't just say it. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, that will be done on earth as in heaven. God, we have watered down this rhyme. It's just as effective as little Bo Peep unless you know and understand and believe and have faith and move. You know what I mean? Obedience. It's just, it's just, a, it's just a nursery rhyme. But it is a powerful prayer. Because Jesus says, pray like this. Right? He says, our Father in heaven, holy be your name. You know, the, the, what I love about this prayer is it starts with praise and it ends with praise. Because at the end he says, and for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. And yours is the kingdom and the power. This is how he wraps up, starts and wraps up this prayer, okay? With praise, making his name holy. Be, and talking about it's his kingdom coming. The second part of this is God's plan. Wow. 42 years to understand this. Your kingdom come, your will be done has nothing to do with what I want. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Nothing about God help my plan. No, no, no. Your plan. What is your plan for your life? Whatever you want in heaven, let me know. I want to see it. I want to know it. Tell me God's plan for your life is better than your plan for your life. And that's when we get God's vision for our lives. And you're saying it. You're saying it, but you're not asking. God, your kingdom come. Your will be done. Okay, we'll do this. Well, I, I just don't. I'm busy. I kind of have this worked out. I, but you're saying your kingdom come, you will be done. I know. Jesus was the great, greatest example of this. His humanity in Matthew 26 when he's in the garden and he's praying and he says, God, he knows he's about to go to the cross and die. And he says, Father, if it's any way possible that this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. That's the greatest understanding of what his will is. Our allegiance it needs to be to God. Okay, so God's provision. He's the bread of life. He's fed the 5,000. We understand that. And basically, when you, when you say, give us this day our daily bread, is saying and, and, and acknowledging and understanding that he wants to give you everything that you need. Day by day, one day at a time, he wants to give you everything you need. Not everything that we want off of Amazon. 
not everything that we want, Moses, in the gun store. But I'm going to give you everything you need. And then God's pardon. We need God's pardon. Verse 12 says, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. That means we have to forgive our debtors. We have to forgive people who hurt us, people who talk about us, people who come against us. Forgive them in advance. You know people are going to hurt you, church. Just like he said on the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Luke 23, 34. And lastly, he says, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is a part of the prayer that every church knows. But I feel like a lot of churches do this. Or this, sorry. They don't want to recognize that there is an evil one. And lead us not into temptation. This is Jesus. But deliver us from the evil one. You're asking, number one, Father, help me not to call into the temptation. You know what your temptation is. You know exactly what it is. And say, God, today I'm going to have an opportunity to sin. But in those moments that I am weak, deliver me from it. Get me away from it. And church is basically reminding us that every day we got to fight this thing called the devil. Every single day is a spiritual battle. Nehemiah said, you're going to have to fight for your families. You're going to have to fight for your spouse. You're going to have to fight for your kids. You're going to have to fight for this church. When we pray this, listen very closely, we acknowledge that we are no match for the devil. But we are acknowledging more that the devil is no match for our God. You understand? You're saying, you know, you can get me. That's fine. But greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. When you acknowledge the fact that the devil will mess you up, but God is going to intervene. God is going to come. Deliver me from God. Lord, I need you because I can't deliver myself. I need help. Send me people to help me. Deliver me from evil. All right, we covered being intentional. We covered recognizing who's on the phone. We covered getting along with God. We covered the types of prayers. We covered the Lord's model. Now we're alone with God. And, 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 and we're, we, we've done that. We're, we're waiting for his answer. We've gone through all this trouble. We're talking to God. We're talking to our Father. We're prepositioning himself for his advice, for his guidance, his will. Now what? Are you listening? Is he speaking? I mean, let's be honest. How many times have you prayed and heard the exact answer that you need? Maybe you're holier than I am. Maybe you hear it all the time. Maybe God talks to you and tells you exactly what you have prayed to him for. That's not me. I wait and I hear. I'm waiting, Lord. I'm here. I mean, maybe, I don't know. Maybe I got to pray in English and Spanish. Maybe, maybe I got to pray harder. Let me tell you something. There's a few keys that are actually going to help you hear his voice. A few things is to know that he only speaks the truth. You understand? In Job 34, 12 declares, It is unthinkable that God would do any wrong, that the Almighty would pervert any justice. If you have any doubt... That God doesn't speak truth, he is not going to speak. Like the great prophet said, you can't handle the truth. That's why sometimes we don't listen. He begins to speak it. Poof. I don't like this in your life. I, this is not, this can't work in my kingdom. The second key is to know that the Bible is God's very words the Greek, the Greek is called scripture it's called graphe and in 2 Timothy 3.16 it, it lets us know that these are literally breathed out by God that all scripture is God breathed catch this church there are times especially if you've checked off that list 
know that you're humble and that you're uh, close to him and that you're seeking him, he will speak to you. He's spoken to some of you. I don't even know that. But nine times out of ten, because he's a good father, he's already spoken. Every answer that you're looking for, every situation that is coming at you, he's a good father. He not only spoke it to you, he left you notes. We don't read them. We say, God, I want you to answer this prayer. I want to know how to handle the situation. I want to know how to get out of this with this situation at work with this this person who I have an emotional uh, affair with, I want to figure out how to deal with my pornography. I want to deal with those are situations that I deal with now that, that can't possibly be in the Bible. It's the same thing. The fruit is different. The root is the same. He's not going to leave you just dangling. So yes, there will be days that he will speak audibly to somebody, maybe. But one thing we have to be very careful of, church, listen to what I'm saying is that a lot of us don't do things based on we're waiting for God. The, the whole thing is, sits really hard with me when I hear people that I know are destined, that I know are anointed, that I know have talents and purpose in the kingdom, to say, ah, oh, I'm going to pray about it. All I want, all I'm thinking is, check your schedule. Does it align with the will of God? Do it! What are you waiting for? You're waiting for him to tell you? He told you, feed my sheep. He told you, what to do the words are God breathed the answer to the prayers the answer to the questions the situations life death marriage anything has already been written we sit waiting for an audible voice in order to hear this voice and to understand the word you're going to have to turn from sin. You're going to have to have a humble heart, and you're going to have to live a righteous life. Do you hear that? You're going to have to turn from sin, things that don't, that don't fit in the kingdom of God. You're going to have to have a humble heart. That means you can't be proud, Moses. I don't care how good you speak. I don't care where God has put you at. I don't care how people respect you. You need to be humble. If you want to hear from me, if you want to understand the words, you need to live a righteous life. 5.16 and James says, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. There's a few things, church, as I conclude. And I thank y'all for being patient. Whew. There's a few things that hinder our prayers from being answered. Listen very carefully. We're saying, God, okay, I get it. Okay, it's in, it's in here, but I read it and I don't understand it, or I just, I'm just turned off. I don't, I don't like to read. I don't know. It's just so hard, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble. There's reasons why our prayers can be hindered. James four three through four says, even when you ask, even when you pray, you don't get it because your motives are wrong. You only want what you want so that it gives you pleasure. And there I put success, money, things that money buy, pride, prestige. He says, that's why I don't answer you, because your motives are wrong. Let me tell you, I think there's six things or five things. Number one, things that could hurt an effective prayer is this, a lack of faith. Hebrews 11, 16 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he comes, for who he comes to God must believe, he who comes to God must believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The second thing is unconfessed sin. Oh man, I have learned so much in the last three years or four years about how unconfessed sin just, I mean, keeps you in a bubble. Man, it, not, again, 
you're saved. Praise God, right? You believe with your mouth, you confess your name, you know, and believe it in your heart, you shall be saved. But you want prayers, you want prayers answered. And he says, unconfessed sin will hinder that. It'll slow down these prayers, it'll stop these prayers. Another thing is unforgiveness, guys. Unforgiveness hinders our prayers. If there's somebody we need to forgive, I don't care if it's me, I don't care if it's David, I don't care who it is, by, oh my goodness, if you can just understand that this is necessary for your prayers to be effective. You need to forgive your mom, your dad, your whatever, your boss, somebody, an ex. I don't care who it is. You need to forgive them if you want these two things to be effective. People who hurt you, people who talk about you, Another thing that hurts our prayers is marital conflict. The pastor said it. Obedience. In 1 Peter 3 7, it says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you in the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Are you ruling there? Are you just beating her around? Emotionally, verbally, do you not know she's the weaker vessel? Are you showing her grace? Your prayers may be hindered. Ephesians 5, 22, 20 to 24 says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even if, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so should wives submit to their husbands in everything. Are we submitting to our wives, our husbands? It's obedience. Disobedience. Husbands, are we submitting to Christ? Disobedience. The last one is basically our motives are wrong. When we pray for things, we're just praying for stuff that's going to benefit ourselves and we're selfish. Brothers and sisters, I, there's an opportunity now. I'm going to ask uh, Minister Javi to join me. And I want to invite you. All of us are praying for something. All of us are praying for someone. Well, we should. You should be praying for yourself, too. If you want to take that challenge, you, you're going to need help. I promise you, because I'm going to need help to get along with God. Ask for help. If we're struggling with these motives, these selfish things that we want, if we're struggling with our marital problems, our lack of faith comes. You know, I just want to mention this. My wife's in the back there with little Moses. You know, in obedience, my wife was in here. You saw her for a long time. It wasn't that, it wasn't until we were at a conference. The Lord Spoke to her, talked to her, I don't know, moved her heart. I'm not too sure. But she came and testified that the Lord had been telling her to baptize herself. And she had been baptized when she was little in the Catholic Church, I believe. And for a long time, she just thought that was fine. But at one point, God began to have that conversation with her. She didn't tell me about it. It's an internal thing. There's things that you're dealing with that you're not talking to me about it, and that's fine. What I'm trying to say is when she decided to obey God, God showed up. And he began to answer prayers. There's one, he's about eight months right now. He's kind of crazy. But do you understand what I'm saying? You know what God has asked you to do. Do it. This altar is open this morning. The only thing I'm going to say is confessing sin is hard. Marriage is private. Don't let unforgiveness or these things keep you with your prayer lines cut off. Your father is waiting to hear from you. Call your father. Amen. That's my Amen. <laughs> Trying to take my notes. Amen. 
What a beautiful, beautiful word. And it seems so easy, right? To disconnect, to reconnect, confess your sins, look in the mirror and just recognize how unrighteous you are. It seems so simple. But in reality, it, it, it's tough. And it's tough to have a relationship with God the Father when most of us had no relationship with our dad. You see, the most important relationship between our parents is, is our dad. The, mo- the mother is important as well, but if you never had a dad to love, if you never had a dad around, he was always working, or maybe he was around, but the fact that he never showed you love because he was never shown love. He grew up in, a, in an era where it was just work, work, work from the age of five, four, six, and it never stopped. And because his dad didn't show him love, he doesn't show you love, and because he doesn't show you love, You've developed this identity as a result of that lack of love. And it's tough to have a relationship with God the Father when you yourself were never taught how to love. It's hard to love someone. And this is why we struggle not only with our relationship with God, but we struggle with our, with our marriages. We struggle with friendships. We struggle at work because we don't know how to communicate. And God never created us or intended us to be beings of lack of communication. That's why he gave us a tongue, a mouth. And it was to to communicate. Now I know that All of you here today, those of you that are watching, you have a good intention in your heart. There's something in you that you're seeking something. You're after something. There's something that brought you here today. There's something that woke you up and said, I'm going to church. And you may not even realize what it is. We think that naturally in our heads that, you know, this coming into this place, you know, we're going to feel better, but we don't even know what what we're sick from. We don't know what we're lacking. And the truth of the matter is, is, is to be able to communicate with God the Father, to be able to reconnect with Him or to connect with Him for the first time. Because a lot of us have been in the church, a lot of us have been believers, but there's no fruit in your life. You're still the same person. You're still struggling. You're still battling. You're still in the vicious cycles. You do good and you do good and then you relapse. You control your temper for so many months or a year, whatever, and something triggers you and you relapse. And deep inside, when you're alone, you know who you are. But to to be able to have that relationship with God, the Father, to be able to truly see the fruit in your life, God needs to do surgery in your heart. See, showing up to church is just putting a Band-Aid on the problem. I don't care if you come every Sunday. I don't care if you come every Wednesday. I don't care if you serve. I don't care if you're the usher, if you're the worship leader. That doesn't matter to me. And it doesn't matter to God. Like Moses said, what God wants is he wants the transparency. He wants you to look in the mirror and say, I am a sinner. I have fallen short of the glory of God and there's nothing righteous in me. It was only the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Christ that makes me right. And because you have carried this guilt all your life, 
because you failed. You failed as a child. You failed as a friend. You failed as, as, a, as a husband, as a wife. And you struggled and you've carried this guilt and this guilt has kept you from connecting with the Father. This guilt has kept you from connecting with your spouse, with your parents, with others. There are people that have been in the church for years and years and years and there's no fruit. It doesn't matter how much scripture you know. It doesn't matter how much you pray. It doesn't matter how much you read because that's just the band-aid. You need to go back to the root of your fruit. Why are you the way you are? You need to take this time and reflect. How was my relationship with my dad? Was he around? Did I lose him at a young age? Did he ever tell me that he loved me? Did he go to my baseball game? Did he go to my recital? Did he read me my bedtime story? Was I shown that fatherly love? And the truth of the matter is, is that most of us, we don't have that. We didn't have that. And because we didn't have that, that's the reason who we are today. And we struggle and we, we're struggling in the marriage. And Moses is telling us today that, that we got to disconnect to reconnect. And you know that disconnection is? That you need to go and, and you need to reflect on your life. Take a mirror with you wherever you go and look at yourself and ask yourself who you are. Ask yourself, those questions ask yourself what are you seeking why are you here what is it that you want from all this what is it that you want from your sacrificial time of getting up today of going next week with the women what is what is your point what are you after Stop putting a band-aid over your soul. Stop putting a band-aid over your heart and confront the root of your fruit. If you notice at the end of that scripture, he talks about forgiveness. Moses talked about forgiveness because forgiveness is the number one thing that will keep you from connecting with the Father. Because you know how the enemy works? Uh, most of us have unforgiveness because we feel like a victim. And we were hurt or deceived or lied to in some way. And because we never dealt with that emotion, right? The Bible says, don't let the sun go down being angry. Why? Because time is against you. Because if you don't deal with the emotion, eventually that hurt, it turns into anger. And you don't even realize it. And the anger turns into resentment. And the resentment, it turns into rage. And the rage, it turns into rebellion, into bitterness. And then the last one, which is the worst one in my opinion, is coldness. Now you don't even realize who you are. You don't realize that you're bitter. You don't realize that you're rebellious. You don't, you don't realize that you can't submit. You don't realize that there's a lack of love that is rooted in you. Your heart needs healing. You can't feed the sheep if you yourself are starving. You can't go and stand in the gap for anyone when you yourself are lacking, when you yourself are sick. It's like having the coronavirus. No one wants to be near you because they don't want to get sick. You're contagious. And who you are, who you hang with is who you are. So I want to encourage you to come into this altar today. And it's not going to be easy. I'm telling you right now. It's easy to preach the word. It's easy to preach scripture so easy trust me 
But when it comes down to it, when it comes to walk the walk, it's tough. And Moses can testify to that. I can testify to it. We all can. And I'm going to tell you that the first step in this freedom and connecting with God the Father is recognizing that you have a problem. Recognizing that there's a root that you need to deal with. It's time to forgive yourself. It's time to forgive others. So as the worship team sings this last song, come to the altar. If God was here today and he gave you one opportunity, one opportunity to come up and to ask for whatever you wanted, whatever you were seeking, what would it be? What is it that you're after? Is it freedom? Is it to discover the true identity that Christ sent you to this earth with? What is it? There are ministers here today that that want to pray for you. But I want to encourage you to come up, to be brave, to be strong, to be courageous, and take back what the enemy has stolen from you. I want you to know that this battle is not a battle between flesh and blood. It's a spiritual battle. God wants to see the fruit. The time is now.